This episode of the Clark Howard Podcast is brought to you by Progressive. Are you thinking more about how to tighten up your budget these days? Drivers who save by switching to Progressive save over $700 on average, and customers can qualify for an average of six discounts when they sign up. A little off your rate each month goes a long way. Get a quote today at Progressive.com. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. National annual average insurance savings by new customers surveyed in 2020. Potential savings will vary. Discounts vary and are not available in all states and situations. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the Clark Howard Show. Our mission to serve and empower you so you make better financial decisions in your life. In today's episode, have you heard about right to repair your gadgets? I'll tell you what this will mean in your life. And later, TIAA never had a bad rep with me until a few years ago, but has gotten into trouble for doing some really terrible things. I'm going to fill you in on a company that historically has been a great place to invest your money that now has a big question mark around it. So, right to repair. This is something there have been fights about state by state and now across the United States for years and years. Let me take you back. So you, let's say you buy a car, whatever brand it is, and you decide you don't really like the franchise dealer service department. And there's an independent. Someone who's just an unbelievable mechanic, like Krista's Auto Repair. Not really. That's not where we'd go. Anyway. Definitely not. Not you. So, uh, but, you know, just for this okay. circumstance, Krista's Car Repair. And you bring in your car, and there's a problem with it, and there's a diagnostic that needs to be run on it. So the auto manufacturer doesn't want Krista's Auto Repair to be able to do it, and they don't want you to be a shade tree mechanic and do it yourself. So they don't share the information that is needed by a third party, the owner of the vehicle, or the independent repair shop, what they need to be able to fix that car. And this is, in my mind, a completely crooked, illegal, rotten, terrible thing. Well, this same stuff has migrated from the automobile industry to the electronics industry. And electronics manufacturers have been doing everything they can to prevent third-party repair of their items or consumer repair of their items and have not been willing to share parts for repair have not been willing to share diagnostics for repair, on and on and on. And now there's an executive order in Washington to require right to repair. It'll be a while before it might happen, and there'll be the fights in the courts. But I found it very interesting that the co-founder of Apple, Steve Wozniak, said, quote, it's time to recognize the right to repair. Well, Steve, thank you for your forward thinking, but it's actually way late. This is something that we should have always had. And we're in a real tug of war with greedy manufacturers of products that want not only to have the money up front, but when the thing they sold you isn't behaving, isn't working, they want to be able to have a second pass at your wallet. And that is not okay. And I have talked about right to repair. Let's see. 35 years now, I think I've talked about right to repair. And there are a lot of times I feel like Don Quixote in his windmill. It's just, it's just the way it is. But I really feel so strongly about this that your stuff, once you buy it, is your stuff. And uh, something else we're going to have to deal with, I think about the electronics that the electronic manufacturer will stop supporting a particular item you bought. This has been a big problem lately for people with Chromebooks, that older Chromebooks 
Google just said, yeah, we're not going to support those anymore. And then you have a worthless piece of electronics that you paid good money for. There was such a blowback at Google about this insane idea that now Google says, okay, okay, you buy one now. We're going to support it for a lot of years. I mean, remember Google used to say that their key corporate mantra was do no evil? I wish they could remember that. Krista? Okay, Clark. Anonymous in Ohio says, I have a tip for people that may like the convenience of the big monster mega banks with their thousands of branches. There's a credit union network called Co-op Shared Branching that you don't talk about very often. It allows me to walk into almost any credit union in the USA and complete transactions as if I were in my own credit union. There's also an ATM network that is part of the Co-op network. Okay. Anonymous. We're getting more and more people posting anonymously, aren't we? Uh, Anyway, I want to thank you, Anonymous, because you're completely right, and it's something that I've used and never mentioned, and it is an anecdote. Did I get that right? Oh, an antidote. Antidote. Sorry. Okay. You're telling an anecdote, but it's an antidote to- An antidote to the giant monster mega banks that people are with because- they're worried that they're going to be who knows where and their giant monster mega bank will have a branch. But then with the co-op, you're going to have more branches available to you than any of the giant monster mega banks. So take that, you giant monster mega bank, and stick it. Well, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Ken in Florida says, my employer is giving us two choices for retirement. Option one Continue with our current 401k plan and get a 3.5% company match. If we contribute at least 6% plus, we can continue to have the company contribute to the pension plan. Option two, contribute at least 6% to the 401k plan and get an 8% match, but the company stops contributing to the pension plan, although the money I have in the pension will stay there and continue to grow. New employees will not be able to participate in the pension plan, which makes me think I should stick with option one. I'm 40 and plan to retire at 65. Ken, you're brilliant. So absolutely, you want to continue with the first option and be a full participant in the pension plan. Pensions for people that are lifers like you, where you're staying with this big company you expect through your whole career, the reward with years of service from a pension plan are so incredible and so expensive for your employer, that's why they've terminated access to the plan for new hires. It is a great, great deal for you. It means that in retirement, you will have a steady stream of income that you don't have to worry about that will probably provide most, if not all, of your living cost needs. Everything else you have will be gravy or icing on the cake or whatever of those phrases you like. So definitely stay in option one. The only reason you wouldn't go in option one is if you had reason to believe that the company you're with is not financially stable and their ability to honor the pension fully would be suspect. And then you end up a ward of something if they fail called the Pension Benefit Guarantee Corporation, which depending on your level of employment, Uh, how high you are up in the organization, what you make, may actually mean your pension benefit would have a haircut. But uh, most employees are not subject to that. And option one is absolutely where you should stay. Karen in Georgia wants to know your thoughts on using Turo to rent cars for a vacation. Well, I love for you to look at Turo and its competitors, has some smaller competitors. This is where it's a car sharing service essentially i have a car i'm not using it right now or i want to score money from it and i uh, rent it out to travelers at a price per day there is liability coverage that turo provides to people renting out their personal vehicles uh, and normally it will be enough but it is a potentially good way for you to supplement income There are people who buy 
sports cars or fancy cars like Tesla's who the way they can afford to buy a vehicle they wouldn't normally be able to afford is they rent it out regularly on Turo or one of its competitors and they make enough money that they're able to defray the cost of owning the vehicle. Apparently, TIAA has a lot in common with Wells Fargo. This is from Gene. The Wall Street Journal reports that TIAA paid $97 million to settle allegations that since 2012, they misled tens of thousands of customers and were incentivized to find pain points that could be used to scare them into rolling their investments from their employer 403B plans to more expensive managed accounts. This generated hundreds of millions of dollars in fees for them, but ironically lower investment performance for the clients. Sounds an awful like a monster mega bank. If Clark does not condemn them with the same vigor as the big banks, then he stinks like the exhaust from the engines of the iconic Wells Fargo stagecoach. Well, Gene, I am going to address this straight ahead, and you'll be very interested in my perspective on what's happened at TIAA. This episode is brought to you by Progressive. What's one thing you'd purchase with a little extra savings? A weighted blanket? Smart speaker? That new self-care trend you keep hearing about? Well, Progressive wants to make sure you're getting what you want by helping you save money on car insurance. Drivers who save by switching to Progressive save over $700 on average and customers can qualify for an average of six discounts when they sign up. Discounts like having multiple vehicles on your policy. Progressive offers outstanding coverage and award-winning claim service. Day or night, they have customer support 24-7, 365 days a year. When you need them most, they're at their best. A little off your rate each month goes a long way. Get a quote today at Progressive.com and see why 4 out of 5 new auto customers recommend Progressive. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates – National annual average insurance savings by new customers surveyed in 2020. Potential savings will vary, discounts vary, and are not available in all states and situations. I started having inklings that there were problems in paradise with TIAA. TIAA was one of the most respected financial houses in the United States, and they historically have done a phenomenal job serving teachers, college professors, staff, uh, you name it, administrators at schools and universities. That was their specialty. They also have served a lot of nonprofits with their retirement plans. TIA, as I've said through the years, was the only really decent choice if you were offered a 403B where you work. Well, What happened, and I first talked about this when there were just allegations, which was, I feel like that was five or six years ago, and TIA was accused, I know it's called TIA, I just call it TIA for short, TIA was accused of doing exactly what they have just been fined roughly $100 million for, and in my opinion, the fine is not nearly enough. The behavior that was not some rogue employees, it was the way things were working at TIA, is maddening, infuriating, and inexcusable. It's the kind of behavior, in my opinion, people should go to prison for. Because they were effectively stealing money from the people who trusted them with their money. What Tia was doing, as Krista read just a few minutes ago from the post from Gene, is people were in employer-provided, extremely low-cost 403Bs, and they would use hard-sell salespeople to convince them to roll out of the really low-cost plan and go into an ultra-high-cost individual plan. It is shameful disgusting and inexcusable and from here forward I will be watching Tia like a hawk because I am horrified and it's hard with any organization where you've spent a few generations building up trust 
When you violate that trust and cheat people who have trusted you, it's hard to ever rebuild that trust. And I will tell you, the statement from Tia was not apologetic enough, not contrite enough, not taking responsibility enough. I hated the PR garbage they put out after they paid the fine. So the question is, and I know it's going to come from people, and I'm going to address it now, and then I'll address it as the posts come with questions. If your employer offers a retirement plan through TIAA, should you do it? So, gosh, you're going to have to make sure that the expenses are clear and are A-OK. Because historically, with the employer plans, TIA has been the best to go to for a 403B plan. But I am angry. Obviously, you can tell. I'm actually more than angry about this. I have been furious about this, that an organization that has so been there for our hardworking teachers and educators in this country and has been a shining light in helping teachers reach an affordable retirement has turned around and as part of its business design, stabbed them in the back again and again and again and again. And I'll say this as well. When I name a company, call them out and trash them. They just is like Gene. You mentioned the, uh, the criminal enterprise impersonating a bank known as Wells Fargo. Krista, you just like, <laughs> you went to your head, started uh. rubbing your forehead. Wells Fargo, that longstanding criminal enterprise. Yeah, you're right. If I'm going to call them out, I have to call any other financial company or bank, even a credit union. If there's a credit union that's treating people rotten or doing things that are the kind of behaviors you expect from a hoodlum, I got to call them out. And so, Gene, I did it. And it'll be up to you to decide if I did it with enough passion in how I talked about Tia. And Tia, you have the right, just like I always offered the criminal enterprise known as Wells Fargo. I offered them the opportunity to go on with me. And Tia has that same right. But Tia, let me tell you something. You send somebody on with me, it better not one of those be one of those PR hacks saying that garbage where you kind of maybe sort of admit you did something maybe not right, but that that was long ago and none of that's happening anymore. I despise that kind of fake apology. I think Gene might be pleased with your passion. <laughs> what do you think Tia will feel? <laughs> All right. Um, Wells. <laughs> will in Florida says, hello, Sir Clark Howard. Yes, I just knighted you. Could you tell me a good, fairly cheap, but legally, legally binding way to write out my will? What's the best one in your humble but very Clark's Mark Ray to write it? And yes, my name is Will. And Will, this happens to be the day that anybody with the name Will uses that as a discount code, and you will get your will for free. No, sorry, Will. Um, I want to tell you that Will Maker is the big granddaddy or grandmama, whatever you want to call it, of the self-produced Will market. Will Maker is a very well-designed product, and you need to have the following conditions before you use Will Maker. And if you go to nolo.com, they repeatedly do have coupon code specials. Wait for a special and buy the will. But don't wait too long. I don't want you to delay doing your will. So you need to have a simple situation. No thing like his kids, her kids, their kids. No um, drama in the family in terms of how oh this one doesn't talk to this one, anything like that. You need to have a family situation that's really... Um, healthy there would not be in a soap opera um, second you don't have a huge amount of assets that people may be 
interested in. And then the third thing is if you use Wellmaker or uh, you use a competitor like LegalZoom, which is more expensive but supposedly has some additional help for you doing a will, if you're using anything like that and you find as you're preparing it, you start to get confused, you stop. You don't go forward. And whatever you paid with the coupon to buy the program, you just write that off. And then you need a professional to do your will for you. But as long as everything is clear, understandable, and your situation fits the test, then you should be okay. Um, The biggest problem is how many people should have a will and don't have one. As an example, people with minor children. You don't do a will. Your state will decide who raises your kids. And it could be that nightmare relative of yours that you don't even want to be around while you're living. You don't want them raising your kids. But if you don't do a will, that could happen. Uh, So it's really, really important for people with minor children who say, oh, I don't need a will. I don't have anything. You got those kids and they're priceless and you got to protect their interests. Maureen in Florida says we have a credit score of 747 and want to get an interest-free car loan. Is Experian Boost a good way to increase your FICO score? So Experian Boost, you see a lot of ads for it. It is a free way potentially to raise your credit score using an Experian method of taking in other facets of how you handle money and doing a algorithm that then can potentially raise your credit score. The problem is Experian Boost is not widely used in the credit granting industry. So it may have an effect with a small number of lenders, but usually it's not going to be how it gets done in terms of the score that will get you to interest free. But I did want to say this to you. A lot of times when a car manufacturer is offering a 0% loan, you may find that the auto loan you can get from a credit union is so stinking low on an interest rate, uh, potentially even in the ones, you know, one point something percent for a new vehicle loan, that you're better off taking the credit union loan and then whatever cash back that the manufacturer is giving versus them subsidizing your vehicle loan. And Joan in Georgia says, we're getting very nervous about this out-of-control economy. We're planning to sell our property before any upcoming real estate crash. Also, we're putting all our ETFs index funds on hold in this crazy stock market. Are we overreacting? Um, Do you have any information on how old they are? Yeah, they are in their 70s. Okay, that's important information. So uh, the economy is actually doing pretty well. Nobody knows how that's going to sustain over time. Economists are nervous because the Chinese economy, which was the first one to go into recovery mode after uh, coronavirus, the Chinese economy has moved into a slower speed after initially bursting forward. Um, If you're wondering why the Federal Reserve, in the face of what seems like some potentially serious inflation, is not doing anything about trying to slow the uh, growth of inflation down is because they don't want to slow the economy down having watched what's going on in China. Having said all that, we are not going in the toilet. The Chinese economically are not going in the toilet. There's no conditions right now that would say that's where we're headed. The thing in your case, being in uh, 70 plus years old, is what is your source of funds in your life? If this money you have in the index funds and the ETFs is there for way down the road and you pay for your current living in your 70s through other assets, uh, maybe you have a pension, you have Social Security, whatever you have, Uh, You could be a military retiree and have money from that coming from a military pension, whatever it is. If your normal living expenses are already covered by things that are just there like those things, then there's no reason for you to react to the uncertainty 
of today's economic conditions and, as you said it, the crazy stock market, which it has been crazy. On the other hand, if you need the money in your ETFs and index funds to live on currently, it's not a great idea for you to have all your money committed to the market. And in your case, it would be better to reduce the exposure you have to the market by having three years of cash equivalents available to you to live on to cycle through a stock market correction or a bear market. Um, On the real estate, I do not see any conditions that lend credibility to an upcoming real estate crash. The real estate market is not in any of the conditions similar to 2007, and we are not going to have the real estate market crater. In order for the real estate market to crater and the stock market to go to historic losses, we would have to have some tragic circumstance, war, uh, something like that, that would lead to the economic assets of the country falling apart. And so I would say being nervous is fine, but doing a lot of extreme moves would not be fine. So turn your TV off from whatever financial or cable news is making you feel like the world is coming to an end and the sky is falling. And I want to thank you for taking an opportunity to listen to our podcast, and I hope that I put your mind at some level of peace. And I want to thank you for joining us. Please visit Clark.com and ClarkDeals.com for more money-saving advice you can trust.